Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. The topic for today's webinar is the energy storage supply chain, delays and cost increases, what's happening in the industry, and what to expect next. This webinar is a presentation of the DOE OE Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership, also known as SDAP. SDAP is a collaboration between the U.S. Department of Energy, Sandia National Laboratories, and the Clean Energy States Alliance. Before I pass it over to our really exciting panel of speakers today, I'd like to go over a few quick webinar logistics. All of our attendees are in listen-only mode. We have a couple of options to join the audio portion of our webinar today. You can call in via telephone or you can connect via your computer's mic and speakers. If you'd like to minimize your webinar console so that you can view the presentation full screen, you can click on the orange arrow that you see circled on your control panel. And you can also click on that arrow to expand the webinar console. And one thing you might like to do with your webinar console is to type in your questions and your comments. We'll get to as many as we can. We've got a lot of people registered, which is very exciting. It should mean for a good Q&A. Um, do type your questions in when you think of them to make sure that we can get to your question. And a final note, this webinar is being recorded. We will send you an email with a copy of the webinar slides and recording within about 24 hours, and we will send that to you via email. Um, we'll also post all of those materials on our website at cisa.org slash webinars. And that's a good URL to know because it is also where we post all of our upcoming webinars. So with that, I will now pass it over to my colleague, Todd Olinsky-Paul. Todd is a senior project director here at the Clean Energy States Alliance, and he will be moderating our webinar today. Thanks, Samantha. I hope everyone can hear me. If not, somebody please uh, let me know. Uh, this is Todd Olinsky-Paul with Clean Energy States Alliance. Welcome to the webinar. I apologize, I am not on camera. I am uh, actually on the road and in a place where I don't have very good inter interconnectivity, and so if I turn on the video, uh, it may just mean that the audio suffers. So we're doing this old school, at least from my end, and going uh, voice only. Uh, Clean Energy States Alliance, and if you're not familiar with our organization, is a nonprofit located in Vermont. We work with state energy offices across the country. Many of those you can see on your screen in the form of their logo. Uh, CISA is actually a membership organization for these state energy offices, and we help them with all sorts of program and policy development. Uh, whatever they are doing or trying to do with regard to clean energy programs, clean energy policy, regulation, et cetera. Um, this, and Samantha, you could advance the slide, please. Uh, this particular webinar is part of our STAP program series of webinars, and STAP is a uh, collaborative venture, as Samantha said, we, we conduct under contract to Sandia National Laboratories and through the support of Sandia and DOE Office of Electricity. Thank you very much for your support. Um, STAP is focused mainly on large-scale energy storage deployment and demonstration projects across the country. You can see a number of projects we've been involved with on the map there uh, in the callouts. This map is actually a little dated. I should probably uh, update this with some of our newer projects. In any case, we have been doing this for a little over 10 years now, so there's a lot of project experience and um, today we're going to hear from a number of speakers who are involved with some of our current projects uh, involved in terms of getting those projects developed and built and up and running. And um, the reason that we're, we're hearing from these folks is that there seems to be a common experience right now of people uh, uh, projects suffering from supply chain delays and uh, added costs related to those supply chain issues. And so we're trying to sort of uh, get some collective wisdom around this, put out some information about what's happening in the industry, and uh, maybe hear some words of wisdom from folks that have uh, attempted to 
try to deal with these problems. Next slide, please. Uh, so that's my little introduction to our webinar for today, and I'm going to pass the baton over to Anna, uh, another, one of my colleagues at CISA, who will introduce today's speakers. And as Samantha said, um, I will be back toward the end after the last presentation to uh, moderate questions and discussions. So please do type your questions in as they occur to you and we will get to as many of those as we can. Um, so, Anna, uh, take it away. Great, thank you, Todd. As Todd had said, we have a slate of five wonderful speakers, all industry experts, which we are excited to hear from. First, we have, uh, we are lucky to have Dr. Imri Zhuk here with us today to provide an introduction. For those that may not know Dr. Zhuk, he is an internationally recognized leader in the energy storage field. Uh, for the past two decades, he has directed the Electrical Energy Storage Research Program at DOE's Office of Electricity, developing a wide portfolio of energy storage technologies for a broad spectrum of applications. Following Dr. Juk's introduction, we will get to hear from three people directly involved in two current projects. First, we have William Thompson, who is a technical and engineering advisor at the Alaska Village Electric Cooperative, Today, we will get to hear about their project and the supply chain delays affecting it. They are working on building a grid bridging system using an energy storage system to complement their existing wind turbines. We will also be hearing from Harvey Rambara and Russell Morris about their storage plus uh, solar plus storage project with the Seminole Tribe of Florida. Harvey is the Assistant Director of Planning and Development for the Seminole Tribe of Florida, and Russell is the Project Manager for Advanced Green Technologies where he manages all solar rooftop, carport, and ground mount projects. After hearing from these two project teams, we will then turn our attention to Vinayak Walimbe, uh, who will provide a broader industry perspective. Vinayak is the VP of Emerging Technologies at Customized Energy Solutions, where he has now worked for 11 years. His focus is on techno-commercial analysis of energy storage projects, strategy consulting, and investment analysis of emerging technologies. Now that we're all acquainted with our five wonderful speakers, I will go ahead, uh, we can go ahead and get started. Please remember to type your questions into the box so that we can get to those at the end of the webinar. I hope you all enjoy, and without further ado, Dr. Uh, further ado, Dr. Zhuk, the floor is all yours. Dr. Zhuk, you're, you're muted through the webinar console. Uh, if you're struggling to unmute, you could go uh, open the webinar console and click on phone call and then click back on computer audio. Sometimes that works. OK, yeah. can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Early this May, we had a meeting with the California utility. They had received permission to develop, to deploy some 500 megawatts of storage in two projects. They had retained a contractor, the batteries were ordered and ready to be shipped. The trouble was the batteries were in China and the port of Shanghai was closed due to COVID. I believe it is still closed. Moreover, the warehouse had limited the amount of batteries they would store uh, due to local fire restrictions. And there was only a single supply line of container ships, Shanghai to Portland, and these two were concerned with fire safety. So, between COVID and fire safety concerns, uh, the batteries were grounded. The trouble is that the battery supply chain is not really very robust. For example, 
75% of cobalt is mined in the Congo. The Congo still has a UN presence uh, of a peacekeeping force and the working conditions are occasionally atrocious. Well, once this cobalt gets mined, 70% of the conversion to battery chemicals occurs in China. And it's similar for lithium. It's extracted from groundwater brines in South America and from hard mining in Australia. And then it goes to uh, China. 60% of the processing is done there. The lithium battery industry relies on China, South Korea, and Japan. And then transporting the batteries to the US, which adds another 4.1 kilogram of uh, carbon dioxide to every kilowatt hour of battery. So geopolitics plays a big role and potentially an even worse role. The US does have resources of lithium. Geothermal brine processing could be done in the Salton Sea in California. There's a company that would produce lithium with clean energy as a side product because it's, you know, uh, ge uh, geothermal. Uh, we also have hard rock. We have resources available in Nevada and North Carolina. Uh, the uh, North Carolina ones, in fact, used to be active some time ago, but they are closed now. But mining is extremely capital invent in intensive, and you need commitments to get started. But the industry to make those commitments doesn't yet exist in the US, at least not to any serious magnitude. There's an even greater issue coming up. As the EV industry grows, uh, eventually encompassing all of transportation, it will demand much of the lithium battery production. Because it must. Lithium is the only storage with enough energy density uh, to be usable in an electric vehicle. And as a result, we can expect prices to go up. Uh, not so much for the battery, but for the raw materials. Stationary applications cannot afford higher prices and will have to turn to other technologies. Flow batteries, zinc, sodium ion. These have larger footprints but are, potent are potentially less expensive. In any case, they will be needed for diurnal storage and we can expect their uh, industrial production to increase. And since these technologies use more earth abundant materials, it will be easier to produce them in the US. So we need to diversify the lithium supply chain now. But our big chance will come when medium duration storage becomes common and can rely on materials mined in the US for batteries manufactured in the US. Uh, and now we will hear from, as you heard, uh, people who have had problems with the supply chain and some general introduction to what might be done about it. Thank you. That's it. It's over to you. Well, good morning. Um, <laughs> I am one of the sufferers from supply chain issues, so I'll give a quick overview of CPI, first of all, because uh, I think uh, it's important to note that this has been dwell, uh, brewing for quite a while, all through COVID. It's just it has become more obvious now that there's the demand has jumped back up again. So my first slide is a CPI slide. 
as soon as it shows up. So um, this is uh, year over year changes. Um, it, you can see uh, that it's not just in the last month or two that this has been happening. It's been increasing for some period of time and it's just, so far it's just getting worse and it's having all uh, profound effects on the, the whole way that we purchase and use materials. Here's another quick CPI. Gas, of course, is very political right now. And you can see from this graph why. Energy has really spiked. And uh, uh, this ends in May, but it's still um, uh, increasing, perhaps at a slower rate, but it's still a problem. So that's the background that we're having to deal with here. Um, more, more commodity updates. Um, this is the price of steel, which uh, and of course, steel is used in all sorts of things, including transformers. So uh, if I was a transformer manufacturer and I was looking at the dramatically increasing price of steel and then looking at my forecast demand, which was COVID uh, um, um, tainted, uh, I'd be holding back on purchasing steel. And then suddenly the demand goes to the roof and uh, I don't have enough stock in steel. Um, and getting it uh, is very difficult. I don't know if you can read this, but flatbed freight rates have increased 42%. You know, everything is just falling apart, it seems. So our own personal issues um, are like this. For cable, 40 weeks. Um, you know, we, um, I will tell you why these long lead times are a real problem for us. Transformers are the worst. Um, case situation and that's why i mentioned the steel first uh 67 73 weeks pull mounted transformers 98 weeks two years and then finally single phase pad mounts we're getting quotes specified at 171 weeks that's that's just ludicrous that's not sustainable uh, i i'm an electronics designer uh at heart and so it, this really hurts me uh, i go to my favorite vendor and, and everything is showing, if you can see the little red marks, out of stock, out of stock, out of stock. Everything that I need to build stuff is out of stock. And we're used to these people having everything in stock and shipping free within 48 hours. So it's never been a problem before. And so all the pe people that depend on this vendor, they've had the tendency to use just-in-time ordering uh, and not carry their own stock. So suddenly everyone's hurting tremendously from this. Uh, so, and, and even though it's not shown on this screenshot I put in here, uh, some of these uh, out of stocks are actually showing deliveries in 2023. And, and so how do you build something when it's dependent on a vital component? I don't know. Uh, so Automation Direct, which is the source of that previous screenshot, uh, you know, they're also warning um, regular price increases, even though Sony says five to 8% here, uh, this is a continuing process. It's gonna go up again next month and the month after that. I don't blame them. They're they're caught just like this, all of us. Uh, ABB, uh, price increases, steel, anything to do with steel. Look at that, three to 28% for steel. Uh, and then other product lines. It's just bad all over. One more, uh, Arlington Industries, uh, just simple, Fittings. Um, not only are the increases continuing, but now uh, all existing quotes are subject to indexes, which uh, in my experience has not been the case in the past. But now uh, we're back to, I remember the 1980s and this is where we're at now. We're seeing, um, you know, they don't honor existing quotes. So you're gonna have to pay the index if you want them to fill the quote. And that's uh, that would take people by surprise if they're not expecting that. Uh, this is a uh, email I received just this week from our procurement officer, um, and we're trying to uh, get a bunch of custom panels ordered for our power plants, our new power plants. And, and so we went out to the vendors, and they immediately came back and said, well, uh, <laughs> um, we can't meet the, the delivery schedule, and what about prices, basically? And I didn't show the details, but we have a, a similar to... Uh, the out of stock screenshot I showed, you know, they, they uh, normally they would supply the materials. Uh, we have a problem here. They can't do it. So they ask, what can we do about it? 
And we were forced to uh, do this. We've never done this before, but if you look at the answer, this is a demo that we sent out on those quotes. And, we, and the answer is that we will, if you provide us a list of your material costs, um, and we and we recommend a, a substitute, or, um, or or we even supply it from our own stock. Fortunately, we do have stock and a lot of critical stuff. Uh, then uh, we will make that adjustment at the end of delivery uh, for whatever um, increases in costs that they might have. And that's the way we felt we had to proceed in order to get a reasonably placed quote because our vendors were scared. They did not all lock themselves obviously into a a low price, low balled quote, and then get caught by all sorts of variables which cannot be predicted. Now, this is specific to Alaska Village Electric. We're spread over Alaska. Um, our deliveries are made by small plane, and the, the heavy stuff is always delivered on a seasonal basis by barge. We have a, a, all our, these communities are on river systems. The river systems are marked there. Um, the shipping season is from mid-May to early October. If you don't make that window uh, and that there's space on the barges, uh, you're stuck. Uh, you're gonna have to delay until next year. Uh, so there's a definite window that you have to maintain. Now we had, uh, thanks to DOE and, and Sandia Labs, we, we did have a uh, in part, we we did have a good bridging project, which is a, another best system, battery uh, lithium battery system that we were installing one of our power plants. It was our demo for the type of microgrids that we have. This was our demo to prove the uh, uh, the effectiveness of having battery storage, and it looks like this. Uh, this is a German company called Freecon, um, and and here's an interesting uh, we. Couldn't have foreseen what's been going on. We may have chosen a different uh, bidder if we'd known, but uh, of the two bidders that were similar in price, one was headquartered in Calgary. Uh, and if you know where Alaska is, that's just down the highway from us. And the other was in Germany. And we, uh, even despite the fact we knew we were taking a higher risk from ordering from overseas, we chose to do that because their technology was superior. Um, nobody else was uh, offering a four wire, um, three phase connection capability. And they they did and did not need an isolation transformer to make that work. Uh, we did not have a place to put a one MVA transformer. And so we chose these people and we knew we were taking a risk, but that's why we get grant funding to take risks and improve things out. So here's our timeline. Um, the uh, up till about July 2021, you know, we weren't during, dealing with materials, so everything was pretty much on schedule. We approved the drawings, awarded the contracts, uh, and started construction. Our expectation was that it would be delivered sometime in November or shipped sometime in November for delivery over over the winter, and then it would from February and March 2022 this year, uh, we would be testing, validating it with our own resources in Fairbanks. And then March of June of this year, we would be shipping to the, the village and we'd be commissioning it right about now. We'd have it on site. And by August, 2022, we were supposed to have it commissioned and in operation. And, and, and I have to make a note that this is when the contractor's on site. So I got to hurry up here. Um, what we have now is next year. We missed the window. We did not make the barge shipment. So late battery delivery from China, locking down due to COVID. Uh, China doesn't have good vaccination rates, so they just lock things down all the time. Um, original shipping commitments from for travel from Hamburg to the US West Coast was lost due to these delays. If you remember back just a few months, it seems like ancient history now, but we had a shipping gridlock on the West Coast. And um, Dr. Uh, Emery is already reference that. Uh, well, it caught us too. They were expecting to ship to the West Coast. They still are, but they could not get a shipping date uh, when it came time to making the uh, much delayed shipment to us. And that's what the batteries looked like when they were arrived. Uh, and each of the crates contains these cells. This is what uh, the um, battery energy storage uh, system is assembled from. It's nice to see the actual hardware. Uh, this these are the things that are causing us a lot of trouble. And that's it. Thank you, Sam.
Great, thank you, William. Next up, we're gonna hear from the uh, Seminole Tribe of Florida, Harvey and Russell. So we'll wait for those slides to come up on the screen. There we go, all, all yours, Harvey. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Harvey Rambarat. I'm the Assistant Director of Planning and Development with the Seminole Tribe of Florida. And with me today, I, have, I will have Russell Morris, from Advanced Green Technologies. He's the project manager working on our Big Cypress Solar Project. Okay. Just a brief, brief introduction about the Seminole Tribe. Um, we are located um, throughout South Florida and um, the biggest reservation is the Big Cypress Reservation, which is like 52,000, over 52,000 acres. And this is the location for our project. I have 32 slides, so I'll be advancing pretty quickly. What prompted the need for the solar project was in 2017, Hurricane Irma basically devastated the state of Florida and all of the tribes reservation were aff affected. Um, several communities sustained severe damage. The tribe had to close and discontinue its government operations for several weeks and in some cases months until recovery. There are approximately 680 residents living in Big Cypress, which were particularly impacted by grid resiliency issues and outages. Um, and in the aftermath of Hurricane Irma, the tribe was the largest purchaser of propane and diesel generators in Florida. And we quickly discovered that even commercial generators are not designed to run for weeks nonstop. Um, in January 2018, the tribe the chairman of the tribal council formed the Renewable Energy Committee uh, with key people across the tribe. Um, and there were a few things we were charged with. One of the things was improving resiliency. We applied to the Department of Energy for a grant um, for a solar project and was successful. Um, well, for the same reason, the Florida is the sunshine state. And even though it's a sunshine state, um, we don't get the most direct uh, what is it? Direct normal irradiance. Um, the West Coast gets more of it, but we still get enough to make Florida the sunshine state and very viable for solar, harnessing solar power. So a little bit about, about our project. The tribe is designing and building approximately 445 kilowatts of solar facilities and 1,510 kilowatts of battery energy storage system a transfer switches and control system that will serve four essential facilities in the Big Cypress Reservation. The systems will be interconnected to the grid and backup generators. During outages, the best will be able to run the facilities for approximately three hours before the generators kick in. And in most cases, that will satisfy the need because most outages are less than three hours. However, in the, in, in the aftermath of a storm, where there's an extended outage. Um, when the generator kicks in, it will run the facilities, but these generators are, re are oversized, so they will also recharge the best. And then when it reaches a certain level, the best, the generator will cut off and the best will take over to run the facility. Um, that way we'll be saving and warranty on the generators as well as um, uh, saving on energy needs for the, for the tribe. Uh, this map just shows the location of the four facilities. I'm not going to go into it in the detail, but um, pretty much uh, it's the Frank Billy Field Office, which is the, the government office there, the senior center, the health clinic, and the public safety complex. For the Frank Billy Field Office, we are using ground-mounted solar panels. Um, the, uh, this conceptual plan schematic design shows the existing generator and breaker and electrical room. For the senior center, we are actually um, using carport mounted solar panels. And the idea is that the seniors will be able to park on the in the shade. And in the meantime, we are also capturing energy to, to reduce the need for the facility. This here is the public safety building. And what's unique about this project is we are installing the solar panels in a dry retention area. Um, 
which couldn't be used for anything else and basically be generated energy from there to serve the public safety building, which includes fire and police. And last but not least, the Big, Cent the Big Cypress Health Clinic. Um, we were gonna put all of the solar panels on the roof, but when we, when we did the analysis um, the, for the amount of energy we needed to generate, we had to add some ground mounted solar panels and we actually put them on carports uh, towards the back of the building. And this project is under construction. Um, the design the project was executed in September 30th, 2021. And the date of commencement was April 6, 2022. At present, the Big Cypress Clinic, Health Clinic roof pa pa rooftop panels are 100% complete. The ground mounted panels at the Frank Billy Field Office is also complete. The directional drills at the four locations are completed. The piers for the carports are completed and steel for carport installation began on 7-11-22. And now we come to the subject that, um, of this discussion, materials cost escalations and delays and how it affected this project. Um, this project started in the midst of supply chain disruptions. The material prices increased dramatically and delivery times also increased significantly. Um, this resulted in the need for a change order for time and money. And if you look at the graphic on the right, it basically shows um, solar modules delivery and the increase in, in price and time. The materials, the slides you're seeing here came from the backup that was provided by AGT in order to justify the change order. Um, that um, I will get to with regards to how much it was and in terms of money and in terms of time. But uh, these slides were provided um, by AGT. It shows some of the things that affected the supply chain disruptions, like the February winter storm in Southeast Texas, and Hurricane Ida strikes Texas and Louisiana, and then increased imports. And then we had a situation of the ports, um, increased shipping costs, and there were a lot of ships parked offshore, offshore which weren't coming in. There were extra penalty costs for extra days um, and for containers in the yard, and the distributors were increasing their prices to offset the shipping costs. Then select material increases. The, if you look at these things, um, non-metallic products increased by 7.9%. Metals and metal products increased by 42.24%. And unprocessed goods, 38.1%. Iron, steel, and scrap metal. Also, you can see the increases in the chart, um, what was happening. Alloy steel scrap, also price increasing. Metal products, steel mill products, 127.2%. Sheet metal products, 36.7%. That's a comparison between December 2021 and December 2020 average. And at the steel mill, same thing, prices are just going up. Steel pipe and tubes, all of these things are things that we needed for the construction of our project. Bar joists, concrete joists, everything's going up. Fabricated structural metal, also going up. Iron and steel for non-residential buildings, up. So what was the net impact of this? Um, our original contract was for $2,945,017. Uh, AGT is the design bill firm. They're designing and constructing the project. Um, based upon the backup of the, of the materials that are provided, the net change order was $584,794.80. So the new contract amount became 3,529,811.80. 80. 
The original contract time was 184 days, and the net change in time due to delays is 165 days, so the new contract time is 349. I have some good news here. Um, Russell, would you like to, to take these slides, please? Because these were recently provided by Russell with regards to the recent trends in the industry. Yes, I can take those. Um, if you don't mind, uh, just flipping through the slides for me, Harvey, when I when I say. Um, so so the, uh, the good news, um, things are starting to trend back back down um, in regards to shipping um, delays and all that. Um, so right now, uh, you can go to the next slide, Harvey. Uh, this is the, glo the global battery market. Um, the, the demand is, you know, pretty large at this time, but um, with demand, increased demand comes increased, um, you know, production. Uh, mining, um, all things with that. So, um, the, with the increased demand, there's going to be increased manufacturing um, of the batteries. Next slide. Uh, this chart shows you some of the, the, the cost of the um, the cells. Um, the first time in you know two years, they're starting to to decrease. Um, so, hopefully, that trend continues into um, 20, 2023. Um, for, for lithium batteries. Uh, again, also shipping costs um, big, are a big reason we're here in this mess, um, and they are uh, trending down across the board. Um, you can see there, um, they surged in, uh, in May uh, last year uh, to 8.6. Um, you know, they're, they're down this this was provided to me by my battery supplier um, about a week or two ago, uh, so you can see the the cost of shipping containers from Asia uh, has gone down about six percent um, as compared to last week. Um, so hopefully that trend continues uh, going forward. Again, this is just a another chart showing the. The dropping off of, of shipping costs um, as this year is progressing. Um, hopefully things are uh, the worst they've been and then we're just going to see some improvements going from here. Um, there's a lot more, more companies getting into shipping. Um, a lot more ports are starting to be built and opening up so um, the backlog hopefully will be um, decreased in the coming future. Now, um, this is happening too late for us for a big Cypress project. However, the tribe also has a new project that we have out to bid. Um, it's our Brighton Four Solar Project, um, where we are also going to be adding solar um, panels on, on battery backup for four of our facilities there as well, administration building, the veterans building, public safety building, and health clinic. Um, these, these, um, these photo PV and BES is expected to reduce the energy needs of these, these facilities by about 26%. And hopefully we'll benefit from um, the decreased cost. Um, I like to end with this little quote that I, um, that I like to share and end with. We do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. The Native American proverb. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Harvey and Russell, and a special thank you to Harvey. I know that you are at an in-person conference this week, and you were gracious enough to step away for a few hours so that you could share um, this project with us um, on this webinar. Now that we have the slides up for Vinayak, the, the floor is all yours. Go ahead. Thanks. Am I audible? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, I seem to have some technical challenges, so I will not keep my video on uh, for long. 
uh, I just wanted to show my face, but I'll keep my video on and uh, talk about my presentation. So I'll give some uh, global perspective or the holistic idea about the supply chain delays and cost increases. And then hopefully we'll have some time uh, for Q&A. All right. Um, for just about customized uh, energy solutions, <clears throat> excuse me. So we are a consulting and a services company, and uh, we have been in operation since 1998. Uh, and we have uh, regulatory um, services as well as uh, wholesale uh, generation management services, uh, retail services as well as emerging technologies and i lead emerging technologies uh, consulting practice um, we have currently over 14 gigawatts of assets that we manage through our 24 by 7 market operation center so understanding the electricity markets is really at the core of uh, customized energy solutions and for emerging technologies, since we are largely focused on stationary storage and electric vehicles, uh, we have been looking at uh, manufacturing plants, especially in, in the international markets. And uh, that's how we uh, needed to understand supply chain issues um, very well. <clears throat> so the first thing for EVs, are we now onto the roads less traveled? Uh, so if you uh, see, we have put some um, global industry-wide numbers here. So COVID did impact um, EV industry as well, but in terms of its growth, it continued. So in fact, in 2021, uh, it, the market actually doubled. So the EVs that were sold uh, from 3.1 million in 2020, uh, in 2021, uh, 6.5 million uh, EVs were sold. And in terms of uh, the demand on the battery side, because the battery size per vehicle has increased, uh, it has more than uh, doubled. So about 100 gigawatt hour in 2020, and now is almost 280 or gigawatt hour. Uh, so that's a tremendous growth despite such a market conditions. <clears throat> so there was still a demand. Um, now, when we think about the next uh, few years, how the industry will go. So what we did on the right side table, we just looked at how um, EV manufacturers, uh, these top EV manufacturers in the world are thinking about in terms of the vehicles uh, that they are selling and their uh, respective capacities. So they are looking at close to 30 million vehicles by 2025. So we even took the haircut and say, let's say they can only uh, target or sell uh, 20 million because of reasons that I don't wanna get into. But we are taking some somewhat conservative estimate um, and also looking at other projections. So that's still almost a 40% year over year growth for next four years. And in battery, um, it's from 286, we are really looking at going to 1100 gigawatt hour. So that's a tremendous growth uh, that the industry will be seeing. And uh, I think Emery uh, touched upon it. Uh, China obviously contributed uh, a lot in these EV cells, uh, uh, but we do expect uh, US and Europe to uh, contribute or at least their growth would be higher in future years. Um, so out of these 286 gigawatt hour sales supplied, uh, we have the list of top suppliers uh, in the world. And uh, obviously the big uh, capacity really went to Asia Pacific region, largely China. Um, and CATL was the largest uh, supplier, uh, but the dark blue are really 
uh, we were sold uh, largely in US. The Panasonic bar is really uh, largely for Tesla. Um, so again, uh, in terms of uh, the suppliers, the global suppliers, um, they're mostly in uh, China or South Korea. And we are seeing uh, some manufacturing capacity in Europe and US, but compared to um, China and South Korea, it's very little. So I'm having trouble advancing slides. Um, can uh, can you go to the next slide for me, if you don't mind? Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, we expect um, the global demand to continue. And in fact, by 2030, we expect it, it's reaching to 3000 gigawatt hours. So currently uh, it's uh, less than uh, 300 uh, gigawatt hour uh, now, uh, by 2025, we expect it to reach to almost 1300. So significant growth, um, big chunk of that growth is fueled by uh, electric vehicles, but stationary storage and other applications also add. And that's where this US and Europe's uh, push for supply chain, supply chain localization will come handy. Next slide, please. All right, so here are some metals and how um, they traded and we expect them uh, to uh, trade. So this is just the volume uh, and um, you see uh, the big growth really in that uh, nickel volume. Um, so there are two uh, battery chemistries that are popular, uh, LFP and NMC and uh, the metals that are that go into both these chemistries, uh, they have shown significant growth in recent times, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but uh, to reduce the uh, costs on NMC supplies, largely the advancement that had been done in recent years, the portion of nickel has increased uh, quite a bit, uh, and uh, we expected that to last uh, and that really causes the challenges in terms of uh, the costs uh, of these batteries. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so what we show here is how the prices changed in uh, recent times. And from 2019 and from last few years, really the prices have been decreasing, uh, the sell prices and when sell prices broke through that $100 per kilowatt hour, uh, industry celebrated and we expected the trend to continue for some time. What happened in uh, from 2021, uh, the prices uh, have gone up significantly, both in NMC as well as LFP. And several factors have led to that. Uh, COVID was a, a big challenge. But related to COVID, it created other production and logistic and also labor supply issues. Um, and uh, more recently, uh, this Russia-Ukraine conflict had created other challenges. Um, there is a term that gets used in supply chain industry, which is called bull whip effect, which refers to the fact that small changes in the demand uh, sort of ripple through the supply chain from uh, retail demand to wholesale and up to manufacturing, creating uh, the challenges in the uh, supply and hence it impacts the prices. Next slide. So what we show here are the two big drivers of this uh, price. Uh, first, the lithium carbonate, as you see, just uh, from uh, last quarter of 2021, uh, this last few quarters, lithium carbonate prices increased almost six times. Um, and uh, the same thing with nickel. The first one is largely 
um, because of COVID and uh, what happened in uh, China. Um, so what happened, this demand really, um, because of the pandemic, uh, everything was slowing down and the demand uh, really slowed significantly. And that pent up demand started coming back up towards the end of uh, 2021. And that certainly um, uh, uh, resulted in the uh, rise of LFP and lithium carbonate prices. Um, Russia Ukraine war uh, started. And um, I recall sometime in March, um, London uh, Materials Exchange it had to halt. Uh, nickel uh, trading because of the big short squeeze. Uh, Russia is the biggest supplier of grade one uh, nickel, uh, which goes into batteries and that really caused a panic in the market. And uh, since then it's trading uh, quite high. So all these issues are really causing the delays uh, in the delivery and also has increased prices significantly and some of the authors, uh, some of the speakers earlier talked about that already. Um, and as you might have uh, seen, uh, top tier suppliers uh, now uh, really saying that earliest that they can deliver is sometime in Q1 2024 or even Q2 2024. So that's, that's really the impact of all this. Next slide, please. So what to do as an industry? Uh, and the one thing is clear, these supply chain disruptions, um, given what earlier presenters talked, uh, also you can see, so that's gonna change uh, the industry uh, for uh, forever. And um, every country or industry or company, they are going to come up with ways to mitigate uh, this risk. Uh, so the first one is really the localization in terms of manufacturing and also uh, supply chain. So that's one uh, one of the solutions. And other is also focusing on recycling. And uh, there are multiple such announcements have been done by auto OEMs and cell manufacturers in the plant. So um, just uh, advancements of mining as well as recycling. So that will also change in future. Um, next slide. All right, so uh, I mean, all governments in different parts of the world, they are obviously taking steps uh, to mitigate all this risk and so is the US government. So I'll maybe take uh, just a couple minutes uh, on that. Uh, if we go to the next slide. So the infrastructure um, law that was passed uh, does um, provide uh, incentives for uh, materials uh, refining, production plants, battery cell and pack manufacturing, as well as recycling uh, facilities. And um, the, the aim is to um, reduce the supply chain issues which are uh, creating this inflationary environment that we haven't seen in long, long time, uh, and uh, also create uh, clean energy jobs. And DOE already has issued two notices of intent uh, to provide almost $3 billion uh, for advanced batteries, uh, which will go uh, for some kind of uh, manufacturing. And next slide. There is a presidential executive order, uh, 14 or 17, uh, which uh, gives an incentive for supply chain uh, for high capacity batteries. Uh, the details of this are not entirely clear, uh, but it uh, talks about right from raw materials production, processing, component uh, processing, as well as manufacturing, cell and pack manufacturing, as well as recycling. And uh, there are different types of uh, fundings that are available. And um, we expect uh, this will be rolled out uh, soon. So I, 
so that's all I think on on my side. Uh, I sort of went through this really quickly so that we get some time for Q&A later. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Is, I believe that is all of the presentations, is that right? Yes. So assuming that is correct, um, we will go ahead and go to questions. If the speakers could turn their webcams on, um, that would be terrific. So first question is for uh, Dr. Juk. And the question is for proposed DOE projects that rely on buying storage, can we expect to see some give or understanding in project completion timelines for delays due to supply chain issues? I think we've been uh, very um, very much aware of the supply chain uh, problems and any delays, uh, you know, particularly if they don't uh, involve uh, more funding, uh, can be can be done. It's no real problem. Of course, it depends on the program. Uh, in my program, I always routinely give delays if required. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, this question brings up a very important aspect of the problem, which is recycling. Because uh, when we talk about su supply, uh, we've been talking mostly about uh, new supply of materials, but of course, there's a lot of existing materials out there that at some point will be um, at end of life and can be recycled. So the question is, what movement is there to start industrial scale recycling of lithium in the batteries that are going to be spent by the end of the decade? And what is the main obstacle to inserting recycled lithium into the supply chain? Well, basically, the problem is that lithium is a very active chemical. So it bonds very strongly to oxygen and whatever. And so you can't just throw everything into a pot and melt it. Uh, it's a complicated procedure. And while we know we can do it, it's not yet obvious that we can do it economically under all circumstances. Obviously, what we need eventually is a recycling procedure similar to what the lead acid industry has done, where you know the uh, batteries are 98% recyclable, and they have a very active uh, uh, way of collecting used batteries and uh, re uh, uh, recycling them uh, or repurposing them, as the case might be. Uh, more, the, more difficult with lithium-ion batteries uh, because, for one thing, the lithium isn't that expensive. Uh, the nickel and cobalt would be the things that you would pull out of the batteries. But it's definitely something that I expect to be coming because we can't just put all our uh, discarded batteries into gigantic uh, uh, middens and uh, have them just accumulate there. There, it's got to be done. Okay, thank you. Um, by the way, if if anyone, uh, any of the other speakers want to chime in on on questions, feel free. This is uh, open discussion. Um, so. Next question is, do, do we need to be focused on energy systems that utilize less resources uh, instead of more? In order to make an informed decision, don't we need to do a life cycle, economic, and environmental impact analysis on all of our energy systems? Well, when I get to talk a little bit, uh, yes. Um, and uh, I mean, as industry, often we do do life cycle analysis. Uh, but um, generally speaking, any industry would need some diversification, uh, which is what's happening. So 
uh, the the growth that we have seen in the transportation or in stationary storage is really uh, because of all other factors energy security as well as environmental reasons as well so i'm sure there are other alternatives available there are different technologies uh, that many companies are working on and there is a research uh, that's going uh, within lithium ion industry as well there are different chemistries are being talked about uh, so general answer is uh, yes we should be uh, looking at all that uh, but at this point of time lithium ion chemistry um, gives many natural advantages in terms of its energy density uh, especially that goes a long way for uh, transportation applications uh, and on stationary storage side as well um, currently out of other advanced um, uh, battery chemistries or energy storage technologies in the general um, lithium ion gets the scale because of the uh, i mean manufacturing scale because of uh, evs because that's really the, the big market uh, that's out there which other technologies lack so because of all these other reasons it still uh, is the aminan technology but yes there is uh, research uh, going on and um, as an industry or when policy makers um, we do look at different uh, technologies or avenues yeah of course great we, thank you you have to look at the future and uh, electric vehicles are not going to be the driving factors forever uh, because once we get into electrification of everything and decarbonization of everything uh, we will need short-term medium and long duration uh, storage and we will need huge amounts of it so they will be at least as important as electric vehicles Uh, I might add that uh, our grid bridging system project, to which I referred to during my talk, we originally wanted to do it with ultra capacitors, uh, which basically is a carbon-based technology. It does not use any of the rare metals. It would have been a great opportunity, but it was three times the price of lithium. We could not afford to do it that way, and so we ended up with lithium in the end, but we still would like to do the project with ultra capacitors, so they have some significant advantages. Okay, great. Um, there's a question here about labor forces. The question is, how have labor forces on site been affected as projects are delayed? Um, and are labor forces staying stable or are you losing workers? Um, I could answer uh, that in a sense. Uh, uh, we're building a new power plant in the site where our battery system was supposed to be delivered to the contractors on site they have all the equipment necessary to manhandle it install it in place uh, the crew is there uh, because we were delayed a year they're gone and, and we're going to have to remobilize a, a crew to even do the installation now it's a great expense okay anybody else want to take that one if not, we can we can go on. Okay, so somebody wants to know how long does it take to commercialize recyclable battery technologies? And I guess this is a question that is um, going toward the, you know, we need we need other things than lithium comment that was made earlier. To give you a glib answer, ten years and a very considerable amount of money. What, I, I just want to understand the context of the question. The different technologies, which is recyclable. Um, I mean, because again, uh, in existing battery technologies, um, recycling have been talked about. Uh, and the idea is along with the mining and getting the primary supply, we augment that with the recycling uh, 
Okay. Uh, recycle uh, industries are particularly flow batteries that uh, are made of earth abundant materials and where the electrolyte can be reused at end of life. Those will take about 10 years uh, from first thought to being commercially viable. And Todd, uh, this is Dan Borneo. So just to add to that, so we have been working with flow batteries uh, for the 15 years that I've been associated with energy storage. And hopefully we will start seeing um, more and more commercialization of those technologies here in the very near future, especially since uh, the DOE is uh, through the infrastructure bill is putting money into medium and long duration energy storage technologies. Good, so um, is there a reason to think that, I mean, it was kind of implied, but I, I guess I should ask the question directly. Is there reason to think that uh, flow batteries may be less susceptible to these kinds of supply chain issues, or uh, is it just a different kind of supply chain disruption that would affect them? Well, what it really means is uh, if flow batteries are viable, commercially viable, uh, their use, of course, will grow exponentially. And that means that whereas a certain amount will be uh, available as recycled material, new material will be necessary. So we have new supply chain is issues uh, with those. The only thing is because they are earth abundant, uh, they are more readily available, and we don't have to go to uh, remote place, places in order to get our iron or uh, or uh, manganese or whatever. Okay. Any industry well, here's, a, here's a question that uh, sort of follows up on some of these topics. The question is, how will the money going to manufacturing be spent? And I guess this is speaking to uh, some of the new um, infrastructure money available for manufacturing. In other words, will, will the money be going for equipment to increase manufacturing or uh, to uh, something else like, uh, or, or are we just going to continue to order batteries in hopes that the increased market will increase production? Not sure I quite understood, got the question right, but I think that's the gist of it. <laughs> I, th I think I generally understand the context there, so let me maybe try. So that uh, if it's the question regarding how the um, allocation of the money of infrastructure uh, will, uh, it's not entirely clear to me. I don't know if Emory, because of its DOE association, knows more, uh, but uh, it's been talked right from R&D to cell manufacturing to module. Uh, so the the overall allocation is given. It's unclear right now that how um, it will get spent. Yeah, hope hopefully all of the angles are going to be uh, pushed by funding, uh, including uh, finding new ways of manufacturing uh, processes such as. Uh, 3D printing and whatnot can be used for uh, battery production. Todd, okay, uh, this, very good. This is Borneo. So, um, looking at that question, which I wrote, um, so you wonder is it build it and they will come? In other words, give a whole bunch of money to manufacturing, building equipment, and hope people will order batteries, or is it ordering batteries? doing projects, ordering batteries, with the hope that the increased amount of batteries we need will entice manufacturing to do, as Emery said and uh, Venyak said, to increase their production capability. I think both. Yeah, I think it's both. Unfortunately, Adam Smith would say it would require higher prices to encourage supply. And so there'll be some pain.
Okay, sorry if I butchered your question, Dan, but um, I thought I had thought I had kind of gotten it. But anyway, um, it's a it's a good question. Um, there's another que a couple of questions here having to do with reuse of EV batteries. Somebody is asking, is it easy to reuse EV batteries for stationary battery storage? And another person is asking whether the higher prices of new batteries will make implementing Second Life EV batteries into stationary storage applications more economically attractive. We hope so. Yeah, I mean, it certainly makes a case for it, but um, yeah, I think recycling still has a long way to go, but it certainly increased prices does uh, give some incentives to uh, get into that. Okay, start. Uh, that, that, that has been one of the, um, the deterrents, I think, for people to go with solar and with these battery technologies. Um, because I have had to defend it many times where uh, I've been told that, oh, you're going to produce these solar panels and these batteries, but they are causing more pollution than anything else. And I think once we can find a solution and a, and a way to actually recycle these batteries when when um, they, they have reached their usable lifetime, I think that's gonna make it a, um, a whole lot more appealing for, um, for implementation. Uh, we're not particularly enthusiastic about uh, recycling used batteries for stationary purposes because at the end, pushing towards the end of life, the all the cells in a string have to be at a reasonably consistent uh, capability. And, and what happens at the end of life is cells will be failing first. And so you have to const do constant maintenance and take them out and put new cells in and it's going to be quite a bit of headache on a maintenance basis just trying to use used batteries. Well, I can say so there are different applications, right? So if you think about stationary storage now, which are getting put on to, let's say, a market like California. So they are largely really for um, uh, energy arbitrage, uh, uh, but they also uh, participate in spin market or they uh, provide frequency regulation. But out of these different kinds of markets, or at least on the wholesale applications, so participating as spinning reserve, for example, doesn't take a whole lot of cycling, right? So you are there to provide the reliability, uh, but you are not cycling it as much. So I do see those kind of applications as a second life uh, applications there. Well, the, the projects presented today have all been relatively larger scale. Somebody is asking about residential storage systems. Is that market also experiencing or expected to be experiencing supply shortages and price changes in the near future? Well, I mean, we're talking about the cells, right? So say, I mean, whether small or large, uh, the battery cells are uh, the same uh, battery cells that we are, uh, go into residential systems or uh, bigger in uh, industrial systems or grid scale systems. So the the challenges are really on the uh, cell side right now. So yes, they are everywhere. Well, except for the fact that the companies are not really willing to sell in small orders. They would really prefer to sell things in uh, multi-megawatt batches rather than doing it retail. Yeah. True. Okay. Um, and what about solar? We know that a lot of energy storage is uh, installed with solar or paired with solar. Uh, somebody is asking how do the supply chain issues for storage overlap with or differ from the supply chain issues being faced by the solar industry? There's a lot of similarity. Yes, I would agree with that. Yeah, we have a project in Albuquerque at the moment, which is going to install both new solar and 
new storage and everything is having supply chain problems. Yeah, and, and surprisingly, um, for us, the the switch gear, I think, is the one that, that's that's um, we are actually going to get the the batteries and the solar panels, and we're going to have them out there, but we won't be able to connect them and use them until we get the switch gear, which is not it. We expect it in um, January or February of next year. Yeah, the power electronics. Mm -hmm. The, does the power electronics as well as solar uh, uh, delays are as long as uh, uh, batteries? Does that mean? No, the batteries are longer than the solar panels. That's what I've noticed for my project. My panels are there and they're being installed at present. However, um, the batteries, um, the batteries are the second longest delay item. The 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 longest delay item is the switch the switch gears. So, so other uh, things that are required for uh, a storage system, uh, inverters, for example, are there other uh, other things that are also is is this supply chain issue affecting pretty much everything across the spectrum for for these systems components? I would say yes. Yeah, I can touch on that. Yeah, they're across the board. Everything's uh, delayed in some aspect. Um, and with solar, there's so many different uh, pieces to make the system work. If one is delayed, it delays everything. So uh, we're not seeing many. We, we try to, at AGT, we try to get ahead of this uh, when we saw the writing on the wall and purchasing as many solar modules, inverters as we could up front. Um, and have them, you know, ready for for projects. You know, design our projects around what we have in inventory. Um, the the inverters we're not seeing huge lead times on those. A lot of a lot of manufacturers have inverters in stock ready to go. Solar panels are starting to ease back down with uh, the Biden administration removing some of the tariffs that were in place. Uh, so some some more modules from Southeast Asia are, are flowing into the country now. Um, the steel prices, a lot of the steel racking that we put on rooftops, our carports, the ground mounts, um, there's not really delays there. A lot of the raw materials are, are fabricated in the United States, um, but the materials, the prices were going up because of the steel prices going up. So those are starting to trend back down um, across the board in the steel industry. So um, really the, the longest lead times right now are on electrical gear, um, transformers, switch gears, um, PV panels, mainly the electronics. A, a lot of the manufacturers are just back backlogged. Everybody's looking for the same materials and they just can't produce them quick enough. Well, this is um, this is sounding like a, a little bit of a depressing scenario for people in this industry and people who are looking to use uh, products of the industry. Um, I, we, we have a person who wrote in who, who said is uh, representing a, a company that installs residential solar and storage who says there's been a sh shortage of storage for several months in the residential sector. So maybe we could kind of turn to solutions here. Um, so several people have asked whether the presenters feel that the policy changes being proposed should be expected to solve the problems, or are they more geared toward preventing or limiting future disruptions at the same time? Maybe I can touch upon that a little bit. Um, I mean, we can't really expect uh, solutions overnight. So the policy changes that have been proposed are certainly helpful. But it will all take some time, right? Even the building, let's say, manufacturing facility takes time. Uh, so what's being proposed would be certainly helpful, and it will uh, avoid major supply chain disruptions, hopefully in the future. Um, but just an optimistically speaking, 
um, we do see a demand despite all that, right? So that means there is a need and a lot of the time um, innovation is really uh, driven uh, by these needs. So we do expect along with these policy changes, some other innovations will also uh, come in the future, which will help in, the, uh, in solving these supply chain issues. Yeah, but on the other hand, you have to remember again that you're going to see tremendous growth in photovoltaics, in storage, uh, because of the universal decarbonization and electrification. And, you know, if you have this exponential growth, uh, you can't expect any solution to be good for, uh, you know, the indefinite future. Uh, things are going to be moving fast and new problems will arise all the time. Todd, uh, this is Borneo again. So uh, two, two comments is, you know, as, as we're spending a lot of money in the infrastructure bill on renewables and energy storage, uh, there, there is the manufacturing component, and that's going to be very important that with the increased, um, increased demand, we also have increased supply. So it's very important that our, our government understands that and does what they need to do to, to make that happen. And uh, the second point is on your comment about the pressing. Um, this webinar is really not meant to scare anybody away, but to motivate people wanting to do renewable energy storage projects to start their planning sooner. Thank you. I think that's an excellent point. And I was actually going to ask whether the speakers have any advice, and that's probably the main advice, but maybe there's something else, uh, for anybody who is considering an energy storage project or embarking on planning an energy storage project. Well, I mean, there are many other things can, that can be talked about, but in the context of this webinar, which is really about uh, supply chain disruptions, uh, I think the mitigation lies a little bit on the upstream, on the cell manufacturing, and uh, how we can localize that, increase the uh, local manufacturing. And there are a lot of uh, technical nuances of manufacturing processes, as well as the commercial aspect to make manufacturing flexible uh, so that it accounts for future technology innovations. So those uh, things really help with the issues that we are talking about today. For project developers, I mean, there are many um, things that one can um, talk to, uh, but the, the supply chain uh, challenges, uh, the solutions really lie a little bit upstream than the, in the hands of project developers. In my inbox this morning, I have a um, a vendor for touchscreen displays, uh, quite making a quite aggressive push. That uh, here, the one of their alternate suppliers, that uh, uh, supply chain from China, is backlogged significant amounts of time. But here is our product, and it's manufactured in the U.S. and it's available now. That's a great sales pitch. Um, I also have to refer back to my presentation where I said that we had a choice of uh, having our equipment built in Calgary or in Germany. We chose Germany for technical reasons. Uh, we might not make that same decision today. Yeah, to touch right. on the, uh, the manufacturing, uh, Q-Cell is one of the biggest manufacturers of solar modules. They're announced like two months ago that they were, they're were building a 1.7 gigawatt factory in Georgia. Um, so I think a solution to these supply chain issues is to bring more manufacturing closer to where the projects need um, those, those, those pieces. So um, hopefully that trend continues, um, you know, within the U.S. and, and abroad. Yeah, so, um, you know, you, you're right. Um, 
uh, maniac that a lot of these issues are upstream, but the recycling one isn't altogether upstream. So I, I just want to go back to that for a second because somebody is asking whether we need an economic policy to maximize lithium recycling. Is there, and I don't know if there already may be something um, of that nature in, in somewhere in the infrastructure bill, and if so, if somebody knows about it, please say so, but it seems as though uh, there's uh, maybe a need for some kind of sort of national uh, effort to to push rec battery recycling and component recycling uh, forward and invest in it uh, in order to you know sort of reduce the the dependence on on raw materials coming in from from abroad is that does that make sense and and does anybody know if there is such an effort? I think Dr. Emery, as I referred to uh, different circumstances of exponential growth, that uh, if you have a demand for a product that's increasing exponentially, uh, recycling materials is always going to be lagging behind because the volumes are are expanding. The volumes of recycled uh, materials are are lagging behind installations by ten years or so, and also. By sheer growth, the uh, volumes aren't large enough to make things economic that may be economic in five or 10 years. Uh, we've assumed in our projects that by the time we want to recycle those lithium batteries, there's going to be a recycling in place that will take them. Uh, but there is nothing right now. Yeah, I think you're quite correct. Uh, the lead acid uh, bat uh, battery industry, for example, that recycles uh, very readily and, uh, and does it all the time, they still do not cover all of the materials, only a certain percentage, because the total amount is growing and you need new mining as well as uh, recycling. Okay, well, we're uh, at the end of our time. Does anyone have any last words on the topic that they would like to uh, jump in with? Well, I would like to remind people from basic principles that this is a cyclic process and supply and demand may not always be stable, but it always tends to compensate. And so we should be not totally pessimistic about the future. Things will correct and maybe swing much the other way. Yeah, I, I, I second that. Any industry, especially uh, which is growing at this rate, will have uh, supply chain issues one way or the other. And all industries go through this phase and there are always solutions to that. So we don't really see there's a reason to panic. I think the solutions are there. Uh, it's not really a problem that we cannot solve. Yeah. So, so if you plan early, and then when the market swings the other way, where there's overabundance of supply, then you seize the moment and you get a system on the cheap. Mm. Well, calling I mean, from Alaska, uh, I have the example of the uh, Trans Alaska pipeline that was installed. It was installed during a small recession, uh, the price of steel was low. They bought the steel up when it, the price is quite low and they installed it uh, with excellent timing. And, and ultimately we're gonna have those uh, possibilities, possibilities as well. I also just wanna uh, make one quick comment. There is also an investment opportunity here on the manufacturing side, right? So the cell manufacturing plan uh, it's almost like $50 million per gigawatt hour investment. So, and we are talking about at least tens of gigawatt hours immediately and a um, lot more in future. So there is an opportunity here uh, for investment, opportunity here to create jobs uh, and opportunity here overall to reduce emissions. And the investment community has discovered energy storage and uh, they are beginning to yep. invest. Yes. And from a owner's perspective, operational costs 
And um, I think it's a step in the right direction. Yeah. Okay, well, we're, um, we're at the end of our time and I wanna thank everybody who has been a speaker on the webinar, some excellent information here and food for thought. Um, thanks to everybody who has attended. And Samantha, do we wanna mention any upcoming webinars? Well, we're currently working on scheduling some upcoming webinars and we will have information on those soon. Um, so we'll get that out via email to everyone. Yeah, one that I know of is uh, coming up that will be on the calendar soon is a webinar looking at the money coming available through the Infrastructure Act for energy storage of different kinds and, and research and uh, pilot projects and so forth. So keep an eye out for that one that's coming soon. Uh, thanks, everybody. Samantha, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you to uh, wrap it up. Thanks. Well, um, thank you so much to all of our speakers. Thank you to everyone who attended. Um, like I said at the very beginning, we did record this webinar and we will get a copy of the recording out to you as well as a PDF of the slides within about 24 hours. So keep an eye out for the email. And again, thank you so much. This was great. Bye, everyone. Hope Bye. to see you at the next one. Thank you. Bye-bye.